Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody this morning. I'd like to start off with, did anyone have a birthday last week? Any birthdays? No birthdays? Any anniversaries? Oh, I think you did too. Yeah, I thought. You had done, you had done last year. You did. Yeah. Well, now, Katie, you don't be kidding. I know. Oh, that's right. What it was she she went on an anniversary trip without you yeah happy anniversary happy anniversary to Let's all stand. We got a new fellowship course, something beautiful. So let's all sing out on this. that next week y'all kind of sung with reserve I'm surprised you didn't have you do it again <laughs> good morning am I on okay I didn't know if it worked or not it's good to see y'all this morning glad you're here beautiful day outside nice and warm okay it's hot <laughs> But it's good to be in God's house this morning. We're glad you could join us both here in the room and also online. But we are so glad to be here. And uh, just a few reminders for you um, that today, 4 o'clock, down in the children's music area, we're going to ring some handbells. I did say that right, didn't I? 4 o'clock? I'll turn to y'all too. Y'all get loosened up. Now, we're, Marchetta's got us working on some things for uh, 4th of July and uh, a little bit later on this summer, so I encourage you to be here if you can. Help us with that ministry. It'll be great. We'll we look forward to doing that. And then we'll have discipleship classes at 5 and worship at 6, and uh, so I encourage you to be here this evening. Wednesday night, we'll have our regular prayer meeting and Bible study, and the youth and children will have their regular activities. Uh, just a reminder, the CareNet Baby Bottle Campaign is uh, wrapping up this week. We ask you to have the baby bottles back next week so we can turn them in and uh, they can uh, collect those uh, and uh, get them so that they'll have, this is their biggest uh, campaign, fundraising campaign all year. And their goal this year is $40,000. And so with all the churches partnering together, we look forward to being able to do that as they help these young ladies and families uh, that are in difficult situations. Um, don't forget our June mission project with our through our WMU is the for the Operation Christmas Child the boxes, uh, and it's the giving to the postage to help with the, pay the cost of shipping those all over the world. And so, if you can give to that, I encourage you to do that. Are there other announcements that we need to share this morning? All right. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 say, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, 
to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. This morning, we're going to talk about our culture and things that are going on in our world, and so I want to encourage you that our our, as followers of Christ, our attitudes and our actions speak volumes to the world and how we can impact them uh, as God leads us because of His work in our life. And so we're going to focus on that this morning. Uh, as we enter into our time of prayer, I want to encourage you to be uh, continue praying for our world, for our country. There's a lot of things happening all over the world, and uh, especially for our, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in hard places. Uh, and so I encourage you to continue to pray then, pray for our country. I challenge you and encourage you to pray for our Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting, which will be Tuesday and Wednesday this week out in Anaheim. And so be praying for them and the leaders there. Continue to pray for uh, Mr. Horse, Miss Dorothy. Uh, they're both at home recovering. And so uh, just continue to pray for them. Vicki LeCroy, uh, she had a procedure this week, removed a mass, and uh, they're waiting results on the test of that to determine if there's further treatments that will be required, so you continue to pray for them. Uh, Judy Robinson uh, sent me a message this morning, said her aunt, Corey Robinson, fell and is not doing well, so be praying for, for her. Are there others that you would mention that we need to voice this morning? This Wednesday, your back surgery, Aunt Miss Mickey's having back surgery Wednesday. I bet, I bet. So pray for Emma's mom. Chris, her first name's Christy, right? Christy Powell. Yes, sir. Did okay. So pray for. I haven't heard anything. Okay. Pray for the Curtis Children's family. Continue to pray for Hudson. Any others? All right, will you join me and let's pray together. Father God, we come to you this morning and uh, again thanking you for uh, the time we can meet together, the time that we can worship and study your word and pray together and fellowship. God, you, you've called us together. You've called us into your body. Uh, and Lord, we just thank you so much that we are able to meet and to be together. God, I do lift up these requests. Uh, there's so many that are sick, lost loved ones, recovering. God, we just pray that your will would be done. We place them in your care and just have faith in that you're going to take care of things the way needs to be done. God, we just uh, know that you love us and you care for us and that you're aware of all that's going on. God, we do pray for our country and our world. Uh, as we look and things are just seem to be so chaotic, but we know that uh, overall that you are in control. And we, again, place our faith in you. And God, help us to rest in that. And God, help us to be active in doing the things we can do uh, to impact a world that so desperately needs to hear about you, needs to see you. And God, we just uh, pray that you would use us uh, to be ministers of the gospel reach out to folks as we can. 
And God, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for your presence here with us. And Lord, we just pray that you would lead us, that you would speak to us. And because of us being together and meeting with you, that we would be changed, be transformed to become more like you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand with us as we worship. Katie, come and lead us. You should be good and awake by now, so please sing out on the next song. Y'all just like, you're like just singing, barely singing. So sing out. It's the Lily of the Valley is our next song. Sing out and act like you mean it when you sing it.
seated. Aren't you glad he doesn't look at our faults, but he does look at our needs and he serve, he provides for those needs, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, this week, before we get, go into our message, this week we've got a group from our area and several from our church that are going to be going on a mission trip. Our Baptist builders will be leaving this week. Some of them are leaving Thursday, some are leaving Friday. And so they'll be in Missouri for a week, helping to uh, do some construction work on a, on a church there. And so I wanted to take a moment before we uh, open God's Word and, and share the message, just to pray for them. I believe it's uh, something that we need to do, that they have safety travel, they have safety as they work, and then that they are able to accomplish all that they are setting out to do, and God will help them do that. And so... I know Andy's going, I think, uh, Tess, are you going, to you and Jason, and um, I don't know if, is there anybody else from here? Okay, Sherry is going, okay, and so, um, and David Hopper's going, so uh, y'all remember them this week, put it on you, somewhere where you'll see it, so you can remember to pray for them this week, they'll be leaving Thursday and Friday, and be gone till the following Friday and Saturday before they come home, so. Let's take a moment and just lift them up in prayer, and then we'll open up God's Word. God, thank you so much again for this morning that we can get together and uh, come and worship you. And Lord, we do thank you that you saw our need and you provided for it. But God, I pray that tonight, today, as 
we think about this team that's leaving this week and will be gone for a week working and ministering. God, I pray that you would give them safety and travel, safety and work. But God, more than anything else, Lord, I pray that they would be able to help some brothers and sisters in Christ, another church, as they build and, and put this building together and, and finish it out, whatever it is they have to do. Because God, we know that when uh, they do that, uh, they may never see the result this side of eternity, but we know that you'll use that work, you'll use their their commitment to uh, help lead people to Christ through that other church, that sister church. And God, may, they may have opportunities this week to engage people there in that, that community. And God, I pray that they would be bold to be able to share the gospel, and not just to, to build, but to touch lives as they're there and as they travel. God, we know you've called us to make a difference. And Lord, I pray that, that this group, this team would be able to do that. God, as we open your word this morning, I pray that you would speak, that you would open our eyes and ears to see and to hear what you would have us to, to understand this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, again, it's good to be here, and I'm going to open up just to let you know that uh, I want to be up front. This message, well actually the next three messages that I'm going to share with you, I've struggled with. I've struggled preparing, I've struggled trying to pray through and study and think through. And I want you to understand that this, what I'm going to share especially today, has nothing to do with politics. Because we're going to talk about the last days. We're going to talk about, I, I've been drawn to this passage of scripture, it's actually a whole chapter, um, and part of another one in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want you to think about where we live. The things that are happening now in our world, in our culture, in our country. And if you're like me, I look around and think, where in the world are we headed? What's happening? I mean, just I talked to my dad. He's 82 years old. He said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, it's beyond any, anything we ever dreamed we would see in our lifetime. And my question in the title of the sermon was, are you surprised? When you look at where we're at today, are you surprised at where we are? Sometimes we look and say, I just can't believe it. Well, the only problem with that is, yeah, it kind of shocks us some of the things that we see happening, some of the things that are going on around us. But we ought not be surprised. Because God told us what to expect. He told us in his word multiple places, but particularly this morning as we read from 2 Timothy chapter 3, he told us what was going to happen. He told us what we were going to, our world would become. So we shouldn't be surprised, yet oftentimes we still are. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's writing to Timothy and talking about the godlessness of the last days. So follow along as I read verses 1 through 6. It says, But understand this, that in the last days there will become times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into the households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. I'm going to go on and read through verse 9. Always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. So these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that passage and I'm thinking, wow, what a list talking about who we become as people. Now, realize it says, I want you to understand, or one of the things that, one of the ways that is translated, maybe in your, your Bible, depending on which translation you use, talks about understanding or discerning the last days. Be aware 
And we have to look and we have to be discerning, which means we look and say this good and evil, and we be able to tell the difference, able to follow what God has said as opposed to what's happening in our godless world. So we have to be aware. He tells us that there's going to be difficulties. Uh, one translation talks about being untamed, and it's the same word that is used in Matthew 8, 28, when it, you remember the Gadarene demoniacs that Jesus dealt with? They were just wild, out of control. That's the same word that Paul uses here. And then I look at that characteristics of the people, depraved men and women. And then the last days. Well, the question comes, when are the last days? Now, there have been people for centuries saying this is the last days. Every generation has thought we were the last generation since Christ. The last days started when Christ left this earth. With the start of the church, that began the last days. Acts 2.17, it says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That is a quote from Joel chapter 2. And that's the coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, that happened on the day of Pentecost. So the last days began as soon as Christ left, as soon as the Holy Spirit came. We see that the last days begin. And they will end when Christ returns. That could be tomorrow. That could be another 50 years. And if anybody tells you this is the when he's coming back, just say, no, you're wrong. Because you can't be, unless you just really, really get lucky and guess it and hit the right date. But nobody can tell when the, when the Lord's coming back. So that's when it will end. You know, and sometimes I think we as people, as God's people, have this idea that We'll see things get better and better and better until he comes back and he'll start his millennial reign and all that stuff. But realize, until he returns, it's not going to get much better. Spurgeon said, apart from the second advent of our Lord, the world is more likely to sink into a pandemonium than to rise into a millennium. As we look, and I don't want to be a defeatist, I don't think God wants us to be, you know, a pessimist. It's just real reality. Our world is going to continue to go downhill until Jesus returns because of the sin of man. You know, Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 16, he looked at the people and said, you know, you can discern the skies. You look at the skies and you say, you know, you know when it's going to be bad weather. You know how to figure all that stuff out. We've got to be the same way with the last days discerning the last days and the human condition in the last days. Verses 2 through 5 of this passage gives us that bleak picture of what people become. What people without Christ become. Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. The bottom line about all this stuff that's happening in our world is the love of self, which is the first thing he mentions. That is the foundation of depravity of man. I mean, I have this picture, Marchetta knows that I, I do this all the time. We, we're, we love quotes from movies. And some of you will recognize this one, particularly some of you younger ones probably, that, you know, when, well, I'll just say it. Mine, mine, mine. Yeah, some of you are going, yeah, you know what? Finding Nemo, the movie and the, the seagulls, you know how seagulls act. They go flying, flock into whatever it is, you know, and, it's, and the, the, in the movie, that's what they do. You got all this, mine, mine, mine. That's us. That is a human condition. That is what we, we look at, and that's the bottom line from every, all of this. It's about me. My will above all else. And that's what destroys a relationship with God. Think about Exodus 20, verse 3. First commandment tells us what? 
He's the, he's the first. He's the top. No other gods before me. I've got to love him beyond all else. Well, just as soon as I say it's about me, I've just made myself a god. I've created an idol in myself. If I say it's about what I can get, whether it's what the world says, whether it's fame, fortune, whatever, all of a sudden I've made that an idol. I've taken God off the throne and I've put that there. That is the bottom line. That is the basis of where we are. We struggle doing what Jesus told us to do in Luke 9.23 as a human race, as people, where he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That means i got to take a back seat. If I deny myself, I'm denying my own personal preferences, my own personal desires. We sit and watch in our country particularly, but also all over the world. It's not just here. That part of the issue is that we don't like authority. We don't want to submit to authority. I mean, in our country, it started, if you go back and look at where we have come, in the 1960s, I think was the beginning of the really, really serious downfall headed down the hill of the United States because all of a sudden we're fighting the authority I don't like the the institution I don't like government I don't like businesses telling me what I can do I don't like bosses telling me what I can do I don't like ultimately we say I don't like God telling me what to do and that kind of has become where we're at think back look back at those characteristics of what God says we as a human being as a race become lovers of self Lovers of money. I mean, when you look at our culture, that's what it's all about. Everybody says, oh, get all you can. Just so you remember, you can't take it with you. It's not that important. Proud. Surely we don't see any of that around. Arrogant. I sit and watch, and, and you know, most of you know I'm a, I love sports. Sports have just gone, uh, drive me crazy now. I don't watch any of it anymore. Because when I watch those guys or girls play, it's like, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. The, just the pride that they exhibit. And I, and I know I'm lumping everybody. There's, there's not all like that. But it's like this whole sport that I play is all about me. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Arrogant, abusive. How many times have we seen people just get, just continue to hear about the abuse that goes on in families, in our society, around us? Disobedient to their parents. Now, I know none of y'all were ever disobedient to your parents, and neither were your children, were they? Because yeah, we all have perfect children, right? <laughs> that even of it in and of itself. Looks, I mean, it shows us the, the struggle we have with authority. And it's getting further and further from that. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Can't get enough of whatever it may be. I mean, I know we talk about different things, and especially when you start talking about drugs and alcohol. That's one of the struggles with that addictive idea uh, if we get caught up into something. I just can't get enough. It's the law of diminishing returns. I get to some point, and then it's not enough. And so the next time, I, I got to get a little bit more, a little bit different, a little bit stronger stuff. And it just keeps continuing, keeps growing, keeps getting worse and worse. Slanderous. We don't have that going on, surely. We just watched. If you, I watched headlines. I try not to watch that. But, I mean, we just had one of the biggest slander defamation trials that I've ever heard of it's just amazing what people will say about somebody else and for what without self-control I look at our world and it's like everybody I, once again I don't want to make generalizations so much it's just out completely out of control 
people just don't even know how to, how to live, seems like. Brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless. How many times do we see people, in, uh, whether it's on TV or in real life, and they're just completely out of control, reckless, living recklessly? I mean, it's a wonder that we don't see more things happening as far as accidents and stuff than we do. I mean, if you want to watch reckless, just drive down the interstate for a little while. And you see people are going crazy, doing all kinds of stuff. The last one is swollen with conceit. Once again, we're right back to, it's all about me. It's about what I want. It's about my will. It's about my desires. Nothing else. Then Paul tells Timothy, they will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The message our culture gives people is, you make your own rules. You answer to no one. You are the one that matters, and the universe revolves around you. That's what, the, that's what the world, the godless society tells us. The only problem with that is it's an absolute lie from the pit of hell. Because I got news for you. The world doesn't revolve around me. It doesn't revolve around you. But that's what we're told. We have to, our world says, our culture says, choose between pleasure and God. And that's a choice we have to make. But we, we've got, we understand it. I hope we all understand it. True pleasure only comes from God. You can't get it anywhere else. Because once again, you'll get to a point that it's just not that big a deal anymore. I mean, you talk to, if they're honest, the billionaires, the people that have made everything. And they get to the point, and, and it's like, is this all there is? I saw Tom Brady in an interview once say that. He's won five Super Bowls at that time. The, he's at the pinnacle of the NFL, the football. He is the dude. They call him the GOAT already. Greatest of all times. GOAT. He's won five Super Bowl championships. And he said, is this all there is? Got money out the out just overflowing. You can have anything he wants. Yet he says, is this all there is? Psalm 16, 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is the source of all of those good things. God is the source of our pleasure. God is the source of everything. And we have to choose, am I going to love the things of the world, the things that bring pleasure in this world, or am I going to love God? Once again, we're talking about idolatry. We're talking about worshiping something more than we're worshiping God. He says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. One way I've heard that kind of summed up is this idea that the world, so many in the world have of this cafeteria-style religion. And you know what, the old cafeteria where you walk down the line, you say, I have a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of And the next thing you know, you got this weird conglomeration of religious beliefs that you're trying to follow. Well, the only problem is, most of the time when you do that, it is unbiblical. It is not following the truth of the gospel. And once again, you think about that power of godliness. I do these things to, to feel the power to understand or think, no, but once again, it's about what I get out of it rather than actually living according to the guidelines, the power that guides our life, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ. And many people deny that power. They don't want to submit, once again, to the authority of God in their life, the biblical authority. Two stories, this is the picture of this. And the scary thing about this is, and it's even in the church, unfortunately. I read a story about a, a pastor. He was a pastor to Leo and Hazel Gleese. And this happened many years ago. But he spoke at their funeral, did the eulogy. 
He said he was so close to them, he was close enough that he could call them mom and dad. Six days later, he was arrested, taken to prison. Because six days prior, he had beaten and strangled them. They had given him a power of attorney, and he had begun to steal their savings and to keep them quiet and to gain all that he could. Yet stood there and talked and preached their funeral, knowing what he had done. The letter that went to back in the 90s went to Dear Abby. I don't even know if that's even done anymore. I mean, we've gotten so far away from printed newspapers. But a letter was sent to Dear Abby by a 63-year-old woman trying to justify her extramarital affair. She said her husband doesn't know. The man she's having the affair with, his wife doesn't know. Everything's great. She even talked about teaching class at church every week with no guilt. That's the scary thing about our society. We have got to be aware that it will, it will infiltrate everything if we're not careful. So what do we do? How do we do it? Paul tells us, he told Timothy, those people that live like that, that do those kinds of things, what does he tell us to do? To avoid them. Do not run with them. Do not get involved with that kind of stuff. I mean, a lot of times those people that we see publicly, they are cultural icons. They are heroes to so much of our society. Yet we see what it happens to them, how it affects them and the attitudes and the actions, and we must avoid that. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. You want to say it like I've heard some of the old folks that I grew up with say it. If you lie with the dogs, you're going to have fleas. If you will decide, I mean, it's the whole thing for, for, for 20-something years, my perspective, working with teenagers, and we talk about peer pressure. Just so you know, adults, you're not excluded from that. We can be pressured just like a teenager can. And we do. And we fall into it all the time. God says, stay away from it. Avoid it. It all depends on who you run with. It will affect you. So the question that we have to answer for ourselves and for our lives as followers of Christ is, where will we stand on these things? Where will we stand when we see these things happening all around us? And we can talk about just all kinds of detail about different issues that we're dealing with in our world today. But ultimately, it all depends on what God's Word tells us. And we've got to stand on it. Are we battling in that spiritual warfare that's going on? Ultimately, all of it centers around the fact that it's a battle between evil and good. And you and I, as followers of Christ, we have to be in that fight. We have to be in that battle. We can't just sit back and watch. I think that's part of the problem in our world today. Too many, for too long, the church has kind of took a back seat. Uh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's not okay. Now, I have no doubts, full confidence, that in the end it's going to be okay. I'm, Marchette will tell you, I'm a pessimist. I'm a realist. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. I'm with you. I'm glad I'm not alone. I look around, I think, heavens, what in the world? But I have full confidence that in the end, it's going to be okay. But then I think about all those people out there. And when I say out there, Wherever there is, is it going to be okay for them? Now, I can't answer for them, but I have a responsibility to them according to God's Word. Now, understand, when it says avoid them, it doesn't mean you never interact with them. 
means you don't run with them. You don't get involved in what they're involved in. You stay strong, standing on the word of God in the fight. Are we living a life of prayer for those around us? Are we living in a life of sharing what God has done? What God's truth says? Are we living counter to the things that we see Paul list as he talks to Timothy in that letter? We're the ones that's got to make that stand. We are called to make a difference. And we've got to decide whether we're going to be in the fight or we're going to sit up on the hillside and just watch. It's one of the most amazing things in history when you look at wars, especially years ago. Read about the Revolutionary War. And you got the, these armies meeting in this valley and you got people sitting up on the hills on both sides watching the battle. That's not where we are. Not as believers in Christ. You can't be there. You're in the battle. We've got to fight the good fight. We've got to share. We've got to pray. Don't get overwhelmed. But don't get caught up in it either. But we've got to lead the way to a better ending for so many people that desperately need to hear about Jesus. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. God, this is one of those messages and one of those passages of scriptures that for me, I know I struggle with it, Lord, because it looks so bleak. But God, we know that you are in control. We know that you have a plan and we know that we are so depraved as a people. So many times we turn our backs on you. But God, I pray that as your people, as your believers, as followers of you, that you would charge us, encourage us, that we would encourage each other to step up, to be in the fight. God, this morning as we have a time of reflection, a time of response, God, I pray that you would challenge us, convict us of where we are not following you, not doing the things we need to do to reach out to a world that's so desperate. They are searching so hard. And Lord, we know that the only true pleasure, the only true life is in you. God, just, I just pray that you would convict each and every one of us. That we would be able to be out in the world, engaging with people, praying for them, telling them about you, pointing them to you, that their lives would be changed because they meet you. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a song of response, a song of reflection, just some time to think. God has painted us a picture of what things are going to become, what things have already become. But he's also put us here for a reason, for a purpose. Are we fulfilling that? As we sing, if you need to come and pray, if you want to come and I'll pray with you. If there's a decision, maybe God's laid on your heart or something he's spoken to you and you need to make that public, then you come and do that as we sing. <laughs>
What do we do in a world that's coming apart at the seams, it would appear? Here's what we're to do. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall it be salt, its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's our response to what's happening in the world. And I pray this week that you will be salt and light. Mr. Floyd, will you close us in prayer?